Hello everyone and welcome to Study Travel TV Live, a show of news, statistics and opinion. I'm Bethan Norris, Senior Editor of Study Travel Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Joshua Walton, Staff Journalist of Study Travel Magazine. Before we get started, for the best viewing experience, please put the call in side by side speaker view. You'll see an icon in the top right corner where you can select the view. We are delighted to welcome you all today to the latest episode of Study Travel TV Live. In today's broadcast, we'll start with a news story and then we'll be joined by our guest this week, Anastasia Colweis, Managing Director of Insight Lingua, and Justin Quinn, CEO of Centre of English Studies and former Chair of Equals. We'll then introduce a few more stories as we go through the show. If you have any questions for the presenters or guest speakers or comments on the stories, please put, post them in the chat box and we'll read them out at the end. A big thank you to the sponsor of this episode, Londonist. So let's take a look at our first story. The war in Ukraine continues to impact on the international education sector. Some 4.2 million people are estimated to have left the country, says the UN High Commission for Refugees, including some Ukrainian agencies, as we've previously reported. And educators worldwide have provided a range of scholarships and free programmes for displaced citizens. In the last week, a group of 36 Russian agencies led by Agency Association Area has published a statement to the international education industry in which they thank partners for their continued support of students and agencies. The agents said they strongly believed in the values of exchange and inclusivity as the cornerstone of the industry. In recent weeks, a number of major English language testing organisations, including ETS, the operators of TOEFL and TOEIC, Pearson and IELTS have announced indefinite suspensions of sales and operations in Russia and Belarus. International House World Organization, or HWO, has also announced a suspension of the affiliation of its Russia-based schools. However, relatively few other schools, bodies or associations have suspended dealings, membership or recruitment activities with Russia to date, although some universities have paused research collaborations and academic exchanges. So at this point, we'd like to introduce our guests, Anastasia and Justin. Hello, and thank you so much for joining us. Hello, Bethan. Hello, Joshua. Thank you for inviting Hello. me. Hi, Bethan. Hi, Joshua. Thank you Hello. for inviting me as well. OK, we're going to start with a question for Anastasia. Uh, this is a war we can safely say that very few in the world welcome. This group of 37 Russian agencies have been working on this statement for some time now, and there's likely been a lot of discussion on what to include and what not to. Some may say that it doesn't express enough regret at the current situation, but others understand that this may not be possible. What feedback have you been getting from your school partners on the statement, Anastasia? Uh, well, we've been getting some uh, emails with words of comfort, actually, from our partners, uh, where mainly they would express uh, that there will be never any nationality discrimination on their campuses and that they understand that both Ukrainian and Russian students need support in this hard time. And some universities were even offering uh, not only psychological, but also financial support to them. And as to the statement itself, uh, well, we believe that international opportunities should remain open to those who seek them. And this is really the only way how we can educate the future leaders with international perspective and how we can change the world for the better. Thank you. And Justin, CES has grown into a school with eight locations worldwide, but from the beginning, Russian students were an integral student nationality. Yesterday, we received an email from an, an administrator administrator at a school district in British Columbia, Canada. He said he thought most people would feel it was insulting and disturbing to meet with Russian agents at conferences this year. Russian agents send Russian students, so not being able to meet Russian agents would mean the students become the victims here, right? 
Yeah, I think that in, in this situation, Joshua, my heart goes out to our partners and friends, both in Russia and in the Ukraine. You know, my first trip to, to Russia was in 1993. And over that time, you know, and over, you know, those decades, I've built up very strong friendships with, with lots of Russian agents um, and also lots of Russian schools. Let's not forget the, the schools that are teaching Russian as well, our, our friends that are, are, are part of the organizations that, you know, who've had to evacuate their students out of the country and, and, and have been, you know, all of the staff have been really badly affected, uh, uh, all of the accommodation providers. And so let's not forget the other side to the story as well. But, you know, over, the over all those decades, you know, I have great friends and, you know, colleagues and people that I've got to know. And, you know, um, it's not there, it, it's not because of them this is happening. So we need to support and we need to reach out and we need to, 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 um, to help as much as we can, both for our Russian and Ukrainian friends. Okay, thank you. And uh, Anastasia, from the Paris Student Uprising in May 1968 to Tiananmen Square protests in 1989, students have often been at the forefront of demonstrations. In the media, we see Russian students, as well as older people, protesting the war in Ukraine and being arrested. They're risking their current and future well-being, their careers, aren't they? Absolutely. And I can tell you that, uh, well, for example, if you work in a public sector, like possibly you are a teacher at university or you are a doctor at a public hospital, being arrested in a protest uh, gives you a police record, which will affect your career. And if we're talking about young people like students, uh, students who are not at university yet with this police record, they will most likely not be able to get into a university in Russia. Students who are already at university uh, are risking to be expelled. And mind you, uh, speaking about the boys who are 18 years old, if they are not going into further education after they graduate from school, uh, they will have to join the mandatory army service. Thank you. And uh, Justin, our industry has as its central pillar language study, education and cultural exchange in order to facilitate world peace and understanding. We have an important role to play both with the current conflict and for future generations, don't we, by continuing to respect this pillar and keep doing what we do? I mean, absolutely. I mean, uh, even from an example from, from Centre of English Studies, uh, back in the mid 90s, we had Mikhail Gorbachev's daughter here and his grandchildren in, in studying in CES. And they stayed in an ordinary Irish host family um, in an area of Clontarf. And um, uh, they obviously came uh, as different names, but we knew who they were. Um, and they loved it so much they came back for the second year. Um, and I can only think, you know, we, we've had uh, uh, Silvio Berlusconi's kids here in CES. We've had the nephews and nieces of the King and Queen of Spain, the president of Mexico's kids here. And, you know, all of this leads to global understanding, the, the exchange of ideas, exchange of cultures, exchange of knowledge. And, and the idea of the young people today, as Anastasia said, you know, traveling and going to universities, learning overseas, um, absorbing the culture of the, the, the cult of the places that they're studying and meeting other students from other countries and getting to understand how other people think. I mean, the, the globe has, has improved and the world has improved dramatically over the last 25 years. And a lot of that is down to international education and the number of students that travel and have the right to travel across the continent and across the world, experiencing different lives. It's, you know, what we are is we are the gateway to the future for young people. And, you know, we, we can't um, uh, put a stigma, any, any nationality or any grouping just be, because of something that's happening. I mean, this will end and it will go away. And, um, you know, we hope it all ends soon and our heart, and, and, you know, goes out to all the people that are affected by it. But, you know, education, it really is the future. And I think, you know, we have to keep investing in it. We have to keep growing in it and, and, and pushing forward. But, but we, as, as CES, I mean, we've welcomed, you know, hundreds of thousands of students over the last 40 years and they're CEOs of glo you know, global companies, they're world leaders, they're politicians. And, and, and with that, they bring an understanding of, of what it's like to stay in an ordinary host family, what it's like to eat ordinary Irish or British food or Canadian food. And, 
And that's a brilliant understanding to have when you're sitting down negotiating with people on a global stage. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so let's take a look at another story. <clears throat> Uh, it's been another couple of good weeks for Canada. Firstly, in a survey of 10,149 student clients of higher education agency group IDP Education, Canada ranked highest for perceptions of graduate employment opportunities, post-study work policies, welfare and value for money. Canada was the first choice destination for 27% of those surveyed, ahead of the USA on 20%, and almost a third of those had chosen Canada uh, said that they intended to apply for permanent residency higher than any de other destination. And meanwhile, the latest figures from Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada show that a record number of 447,085 study permits were issued in 2021, outstripping the previous record of just over 400,000 set in the pre-pandemic year of 2019. India accounted for 38% of those permits, with more than 170,000, followed by China, France, the Philippines and Korea. Several major markets had substantially more permits issued in 2021 than in 2019, including Mexico, Colombia, Iran and Nigeria. So, Justin, um, IRCC has reported record backlogs and for more than half of 2021, visitors could not enter Canada which meant that some short-term students who might usually have travelled as a tourist applied for study permits last year. Do we need to wait another year before getting excited about this data, do you think? Um, not at all. I, I, I personally think that we're at the bottom end of, of the hockey stick at the moment, that the, 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 the Canadian, all of the Canadian embassies and the visa sections realise the, the logjam that, that's happening and uh, are opening up uh, their facilities and, and increasing their staff numbers. The information I have is that they're working really hard to open up the visa departments to allow more students to, to enter into Canada. They have, had, as, as we know, they've had fairly uh, stringent restrictions to enter Canada. They all opened in September the 7th, it was that they opened. So uh, uh, even at that, a lot of the countries didn't meet the, the stringent restrictions that Canada had put on them. So the, the embassies have been sort of tightening their grip on allowing the permits and visas to work. But, but you know, I, I think, you know, I was at a YITAP call um, uh, last week on the state of the, the global markets and Elan from Yalk agreed. And he, he was talking about that the information that they have as well is that, uh, that the, the visas are opening up for Canada, that are expecting more visas. And certainly by, by Christmas, we expect to be having more student applications and, and more uh, people coming into the country. Um, I have to say, I was in Canada about two weeks ago um, and it, you know, the place is buzzing. Um, lots of students around the place, the universities are, there's a, you know, the, 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 all the colleges are full, universities are full, lots of international students around. So, so it doesn't really seem to be affecting them that much at the minute. And they are looking to scale up and to grow more and, um, you know, to develop uh, more, more additional type of programs for the international student market. Thank you. And Alice. Ken, sorry, I was just going to ask, how does your, your school in Toronto compare with um, your UK and Ireland schools in terms of bookings? Um, we, 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 we passed the 100 student weeks, the, 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 the level this week. We're up at 112 students this week in the school in Toronto, which is a great so we're up at about 84% of where we were in 2019, the same week 2019. So I'm really, really pleased about that. Our, our team in Toronto have done an amazing job, um, uh, you know, sort of getting bookings from all over the places. Uh, South America is really picking up for, for Toronto, where we've done very well. Uh, the market coming in, Switzerland is beginning to perform back again. Germany, France and Spain, Italy. Italy is going to be very strong for Canada for us this summer. Um, so, look, you know, our, our summer bookings are very, very strong for Canada. Really, really pleased with how it's all going. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the, the future is bright and the future is red and white for Canada, I think. Thank you. And Anastasia, there were 1,685 permits issued by Canada to Russian students last year, which was more than the 1,555 in pre-pandemic year of 2019. Can Russian students actually get into Canada at the moment? 
Uh, yes, of course they can. It's, uh, I mean, it's not very much straightforward, but it's, it hasn't been for quite a long time already. Uh, and it is uh, mainly uh, connected with, um, with the fact that we don't have direct air flights and the fact that they are required to be vaccinated and so on. And I have to say that uh, at this moment, it's not only about Canada with, with other countries as well. Agencies are really going to play a very important role uh, because we have the solutions in place of how they can sit their IELTS test, of how they can pay their tuition fees and their consular fees, of how they can arrange their physical travel to the destination, of how they can get vaccinated with a proper vaccine to go there. So, and it, it wasn't, it's not very easy to solve for a regular person, but with our help and our solutions, it's all very, very doable. Thank you. And as a steadily growing destination for Russian students, uh, what kind of programs in Canada are your clients choosing? Well, traditionally, it's uh, been the programs with English language pathway uh, leading on to colleges and universities for higher education. This is probably the most popular product. Of course, of course, we also have students who would like to go for summer programs, but uh, at the moment, it seems to be too complicated for a short term travel. So it would be mostly long term studies, I guess. OK, thank you. And uh, let's take another story now. <clears throat> a bit of positive news on borders reopening as the Philippines has fully reopened in its tourism sector to fully vaccinated passengers from April the 1st. In February, the Philippines started to allow limited 30 day trips for designated countries, but the full reopening has been welcomed by the ELT sector. Eric Altman, a representative of the English Philippines Association, told Study Travel magazine that after years of rapid growth, the sector was faced with some of the world's toughest restrictions and starved of students for almost two years. He said that it would take some time for the sector to get back to pre-pandemic levels, but they are hopeful for a rebound, especially as key markets such as Japan and South Korea have recently relaxed measures that would allow students to travel and return more easily, and flight capacity has also been increased. Justin, Study Travel magazine estimated that there were around 65,000 ELT students in the Philippines in 2017, a figure that was likely to have increased in subsequent years until COVID. It may have gone under the radar a little, but that actually made the country a bigger host than South Africa or New Zealand and close to the level of Malta. Do you see the Philippines as a serious player in the market now and a foil to the more established markets with its relatively low tuition fees? Well, um, actually, Joshua, yeah, I mean, there are a number of uh, alternatives that are, are beginning to, to, to come up as well. Malaysia is another country that, that I would see as, as a rival um, as well. Um, the Philippines has, has certainly long been on, on my radar. Um, uh, we have a great agency in, in uh, Tokyo, NES, and it is, uh, Tetsuya is one of the great characters of the EFL world and uh, uh, Japanese agent. And he owns, I think, three or four schools in the Philippines. So over the years, I've had great conversations with him about how it works and, and, and why they do it and what's the attraction for the Japanese student to go to the Philippines. And, so generally speaking, the way he, they, they seem to address it is that the students can go to the Philippines for maybe four months. They'll do one-to-one -one classes in the Philippines before heading to an alternative destination, whether it would be the USA, Canada, um, Australia. But the Philippines seems to be the, the stopping point for the first four, maybe five months of the program. And again, you know, before the, the conversation today, and I, I you know, I, I, you mentioned you want to talk about the Philippines. We also have to look at the wages in the Philippines. Um, average teacher's wage in the, the Philippines is $373 a month. Uh, that works out at $2.66 an hour if they're teaching 36 hours in a month. So, so it's, it's a much more affordable product and program for a student to do one-to-one -one classes in the Philippines than in any other location. So I see it as, as not at the moment a huge competitor to, to the international markets. I think it's, it's, um, it's a great holiday tourist destination. It's a great place for students to go. Sunshine, food, um, uh, um, 
uh, but the, the their their curriculum is just developing over there. Um, one of from from our point of view, uh, we would see it as a, a big destination for OET. There's a lot of uh, Filipinos coming to the UK, Ireland, uh, USA, um, Canada to to work in the healthcare system. Uh, they need to do uh, get their level, uh, and the OET exam is the exam that we're using for that. We're working with a couple of providers in the market in the Philippines, uh, sort of developing some curriculum for the for the trainers. So it, it, it's a market that I see that will grow. Um, I think it's a good alternative. Um, I think it really the issue is about quality and standards that we just have to make sure, make sure. But you know, I think the Philippines, Malaysia are two markets to look out for in the future. Um, and I think that with a bit of good support and a bit of academic sort of um, input, they should be fine. Okay, thank you. And uh, after looking to the core markets of Japan and Korea, schools in the Philippines are hoping to recover market share in the Middle East and Eastern Europe, Eric told us. When Study Travel magazine surveyed 14 schools in the Philippines in 2018, Russia was actually the fifth largest market. Do you see potential here, Anastasia? And what would make it an attractive destination to Russian students? Uh, yes, it was an attractive destination for Russian students. And uh, we are hopeful that this destination will resume because uh, there's no visa issues. And if there's no quarantine vaccination and other issues, um, this, this is a potentially uh, very good destination for us, but mostly, of course, for adult students and for those who want some intensive language preparation, possibly for IELTS or, or something else. Thank you. And one more story to bring you. Uh, we'll finish by letting you know that the study, the finalists of the Study Travel Secondary School Awards 2022 have been announced. Uh, the second edition of the Specialist Peer Voted Awards recognises excellence in performance among schools, agents, service providers and associations working in the high school sector across 13 categories. Congratulations to all of the finalists. The winners will be announced in a special gala dinner in London on April 25th during the Study Travel Alfie Secondary Focus London in Person Plus event. We look forward to seeing many of you there. So that brings us up to date with all the latest news in the industry. At this point, we'll completely open up to the audience to see if there are any questions for our guests or for the study travel team. These can be on any of the stories or topics we have discussed. Please make sure that your organisation and your name are in your Zoom name or in the question. So if anyone's got a question, um, while we're waiting, we can, we've got some that we, we uh, prepared earlier. Um, Justin, when I was talking to you yesterday, you mentioned that the UK is viewed as being unwelcoming by students worldwide. Do you think there's anything that can be done to, to counteract that view, either by the government or, or any other body? I think what we'd all love to see is, is the right to work for, for language students brought back. And I think it's, you know, the, the difficulty in the UK, there's a huge, uh, there's a huge crisis on, on recruitment right across the hospitality sector. Um, in, in a huge amount of areas, the construction sector, the farming sector, there's a huge dearth of, of, of people working. And a lot of that's to do with the fact that uh, the, the, the people can't come in from Europe and work anymore. The, 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 the migrant workers that would have come from, from Portugal, Spain, France, Germany, and all the rest of have just disappeared. And, and um, I think that would really help. Um, you know, I, I think the, the, the issue as well with, uh, you know, uh, certainly from an Italian point of view, that the they, they, they have to have a passport to come in and not the ID cards. Is, is that certainly an issue for the Italians that they feel that, that it's a sort of a, um, for them, it's an issue. I don't understand personally myself why it's such a big issue. You know, buying a passport is, is relatively easy. Um, in Italy, it's the same as in Ireland. Um, it's 100 euros for 10 years. Um, I think that it's just a matter of perception, Beth. And at the moment, you know, the, the, We've come out of a very difficult time with COVID. We've come out of a very tough time. Uh, and, you know, um, we're now, uh, um, Europe is sort of fighting its way out of this. And, and there were certain times where the UK, for example, with the AstraZeneca taking it all and doing it, just came across as sort of, um, you know, not together with everybody, not on the same road as everybody else. And that sort of has, has had an effect. It will come back, absolutely will come back. I mean, UK is an incredible destination. and and 
you know, th there's such an incredible variety of language programs and language tools and such incredible quality language tools in the UK that absolutely it will come back. And it's not the language school's fault. It's not the education sector's fault. It's just a perception that's out there at the moment. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> right, um, I can't see any questions. So I'm just gonna ask Anastasia one more thing for you. Um, do you think that Russian students are still keen to travel at the moment? Or do you think they're delaying their travel plans? Uh, there is a bit of both, but there are people who are super keen to get out as soon as possible. And this is where the Philippines would be a very good option, really, because you don't have to wait. I mean, going to UK or Canada uh, will require a long term uh, visa uh, processing times. But yeah, so there are people who want to get out as soon as possible. And then there are people who are postponing. But I would say there um, the students who are planning to start their studies in the next school year. Uh, most of them are staying with this plan and are going to study abroad. Thank you. Okay, that looks like that's the end of our audience Q&A section, which brings us to the end of this week's Study Travel TV Live. Our next episode will be on Wednesday 20th of April at the same time of 4pm BST, and it will be a secondary sector special ahead of the ST Alfie Secondary Focus London in-person plus event and the awards we just mentioned. Visit the Study Travel TV live page on Study Travel Network, which you can find under the magazine section in the menu, where we'll be announcing the guest speakers for the next broadcast, as well as a recording of this episode and past episodes. So that's it for today. We'd like to say a big thank you to our special guests. Anastasia, thank you for your time and insights today. Thank you very much. And Justin, thank you for joining us and sharing your thoughts. Thank you very much. And thank you again to our sponsor this week, Londonist. Thanks for watching, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye.